In July 2020, Hull City, who were threatened with relegation at the time, having been tumbling down the championship table since January, found themselves 3-0 down in a game away to relegation rivals Wigan Athletic inside the first 35 minutes. Rarely are substitutions made so early on in a game, except in the case of injuries. But desperate times call for desperate measures. So, in the 35th minute of the game, Grant McCann withdrew right winger Josh Bowler and replaced him with an extra body in midfield, in the form of Daniel Batty. Hull City conceded five more goals between Batty's introduction and the final whistle, losing the game 8-0 and equaling the heaviest defeat in the entire history of the championship. The moral of the story is that substitutions don't always work out as planned, and sometimes they can make the situation actively worse. But in today's video, we are looking beyond the Dan Batties of this world and his unfortunate case study, and turning our attention to some substitutions that really did work out, often in fairly stunning fashion. Now, there are a couple of ways in which you could measure the greatest substitutions of all time. In terms of the impact the player who has been introduced is able to exert on the game, but also the size and magnitude of the game, and the ultimate consequence of their impact. Robert Lewandowski, coming off the bench for Bayern Munich in the 51st minute of a game that the Bavarians were losing 1-0 to Wolfsburg, only for him to score 5 goals in the space of just 9 minutes in a 5-1 win, is surely the greatest impact by a substitute in a single game. Or at least, close to the greatest. But that was an early season game in the Bundesliga, in a league which Bayern Munich ended up winning that season by a margin of 10 points. That is not to take anything away from Robert Lewandowski's miraculous impact off the bench. It is just worth noting, and in coming up with my final seven, I did put a fair amount of emphasis on the size of the occasion and the overall impact of their post-substitution performance. Enough of me rambling on about Hull City, Wigan Athletic, and Robert Lewandowski though. That indomitable trio. And on with today's video. Here are seven of the greatest substitutions of all time. Henrik Larsson versus Arsenal. When I had the idea of doing this video, or when someone suggested it to me, I can't quite remember which to be totally honest with you, this was the first substitution that came to my mind. That is slightly odd because it certainly isn't the most obvious example, but then again, I am quite an odd person. I say that it isn't the most obvious because Henrik Larsson is a forward who was introduced in a Champions League final against Arsenal for Barcelona, and he did not score a goal. I didn't include Robert Lewandowski's introduction when he scored five goals, or Ole Gunnar Solskjaer's introduction when he scored four. So, you would be well within your rights to ask me for some serious justification. Well, in the 2006 Champions League final, Arsenal went down to 10 men just 18 minutes into the game, after Jens Lehmann brought down Samuel Eto on the edge of the box. That looked to spell disaster for the Gunners, but in the 37th minute, they took the lead via Sol Campbell's forehead. For all the varied and mystifying talents of Deco, Iniesta, Ronaldinho and Eto, Barcelona could not break the 10 men of Arsenal down. Until the introduction of one man. You can see where I'm going with this. Celtic legend Henrik Larsson replaced holding midfielder Mark Van Bommel after 61 minutes and 15 minutes later, he laid off a delicate assist for Samuel Eto'o to finally break Arsenal's resilient backline down and bring Barcelona back onto level terms. During his entire half hour on the pitch, Larson stretched the Arsenal backline, running it behind them, coming deep, and just causing general havoc. In the 81st minute, Larson received a hopeful ball from Brazilian fullback Giuliano Belletti, who was also a substitute in that game, and as Belletti ran beyond him, Larson picked him out, and the Brazilian picked out the back of the net with a powerful strike to beat Manuel Almunia, to beat Arsenal 2-1, and of course, to claim Barcelona's first Champions League triumph since 1992. At the end of the game, Thierry Henry, who was being heavily linked with the move to Barcelona at the time, stated, All the time you talk about Ronaldinho and Eto, and people like that. Let's talk about the proper people who make the difference. That was Henrik Larsson, who made two assists. I didn't see Ronaldinho, and I didn't see Eto. End quote. Of course, Eto did score the equaliser and get Jens Lehmann sent off, so that may have been a touch harsh, but he was certainly spot on about Larsson's impact, and he represents a fabulous way in which to kickstart this seven. 
Mario Goetze versus Argentina. An impact off the bench that will be very familiar to almost all of you, I won't dwell on this one for too long. Mario Goetze is a player who had the talent to go down as one of the finest players of his generation, but he has been hamstrung by myopathy, preventing his muscle fibres from functioning properly, and he has been beset by injuries. Those two factors have transpired to deprive Mario Goetze from reaching his true potential, and to deprive the world of football from seeing the true zenith of a player blessed with all the God-given talent in the world. That is a grave shame, but no one can ever strip Mario Goetze of the privilege, honour and accomplishment of having scored the most important goal that any footballer will ever score. The winning goal in a World Cup final. Diego Maradona never did it, Johan Cruyff never did it, and neither Cristiano Ronaldo nor Lionel Messi have ever done it. But Mario Goetze has, and it is that goal and that performance that earns him a spot in this seven. After trouncing Brazil 7-1 in the semi-final of the 2014 World Cup, it always seemed likely that Joachim Love's side would face a tougher test up against Brazil's biggest rivals in the final. Argentina hadn't conceded a single goal in the knockout stages of the tournament, relying as much on their defensive organisation as they did on the scintillating talents of Lionel Messi. It would prove to be a very tight game, Gonzalo Higuain passing up the best opportunity of the match just 30 minutes in, followed by Benedict Herberes seeing his header crash against the post a little later on. In the 88th minute, with the scores still tied at 0-0, young Mario Goetze came on as a substitute in place of Germany's all-time record goalscorer, Miroslav Klose. In the 113th minute, just seven minutes before a penalty shootout would have been required to split the two sides, Andre Schürrle, who again was also a substitute, got the better of Pablo Zabaleta, before chipping the ball towards Goetze. The Bayern man seemingly had very little on, but he cushioned the ball down beautifully with his chest before volleying the ball delicately over the outstretched arm of Sergio Romero. It was a wonderful goal, from a player introduced just two minutes from the end of regulation time, and it made Germany the champions of the world. Substitutions don't get much better than that. Gareth Bale vs Liverpool I jotted this one down on my initial draft, which is how I make these videos, by throwing down a load of possible candidates on a piece of paper, and then picking out what I deem to be the finest candidates. And I did so initially with Gareth Bale's introduction against Liverpool, thinking that he would just make up the numbers, rather than cracking the top seven. I'm not quite sure why though, because the more I thought about it, and reminisced on that game, the more I realised that Gareth Bale's arrival deserved to feature in this seven as much as almost anyone else's. The game in question is of course the 2018 Champions League final in Kiev, in which Gareth Bale was introduced against Liverpool after 61 minutes. Real Madrid had taken the lead 10 minutes earlier after Karim Benzema capitalised on a wretched moment for Loris Karius, but just four minutes later, Sadio Mane had levelled the scores. At that point, you could be forgiven for thinking that Liverpool had the impetus in the game. Only a huge slice of misfortune had seen them fall behind, and following Mane's goal, they looked to have their tails up. That was until Gareth Bale was introduced. Much maligned in Madrid at that time, it speaks volumes that Bale didn't start the game, but after coming on in place of Spanish number 10 Isco, it took Bale less than two minutes to give Real Madrid the lead with what I think is probably the greatest goal ever scored in the final of a Champions League. His manager at the time, Zinedine Zidane, likely offers up the sternest competition with his strike in the 2002 Champions League final, which was arguably an even more difficult technique. But the athleticism, power and precision of Bale's strike so soon after his introduction was absolutely remarkable. Bale added a second goal from about 35 yards out 20 minutes later, following a dreadful piece of goalkeeping by Loris Karius, which I still find hard to watch, but guaranteeing that the Welshman would win the Man of the Match award. In terms of the quality of Bale's performance off the bench, his tangible impact, and the size of the occasion, his introduction in the 2018 Champions League final is, without a doubt, one of the greatest substitutions of all time. Dietmar Hamann vs AC Milan there's a lot of Champions League final action in this seven, more than I would have liked in fact, but I found it so difficult to leave each of them out. The 2005 Champions League final is probably the most memorable final of UEFA's flagship competition during my lifetime at least, and it is perhaps 
one of the greatest football matches to have ever taken place. That may seem hyperbolic, but with Liverpool trailing 3-0 at half-time, up against almost certainly the most talented team on the planet at that time, when they themselves had Jimmy Traore and Igor Biscan in their matchday squad, rarely has a game seemed like more of a foregone conclusion. This was an AC Milan starting 11 which read Dida, Cafu, Stam, Nesta, Maldini, Perlo, Gattuso, Seydorf, Kaka, Shevchenko and Crespo, with the likes of Alessandro Costa Curta and Rui Costa on the bench. Finding a weak spot in that team would be like trying to find ways in which HITC Sport was better than HITC 7s. It doesn't matter how hard you look or for how long, it simply cannot be done. Anyhow, back to the 2005 Champions League final. With Liverpool trailing 3-0 at half-time and Steve Finnan joining Harry Kuehl on the injury list, Rafa Benitez went to a back three and introduced Didi Haman in an attempt to thwart Kaka's influence upon the game. Not even in Rafa Benitez's wildest dreams, however, could Haman's introduction and Liverpool's system change have been as effective as it turned out to be. In the space of just six second half minutes, Liverpool scored three goals to draw level against the best team in the world. In the penalty shootout, Didi Haman stepped up to take Liverpool's first penalty and he punched the ball into the top of the net with a firm and precise finish. Liverpool, of course, won the game 3-2 on penalties. Like Henrik Larsson, just 12 months later, Didi Haman was a non-scoring substitute in a Champions League final but he played as big a role as anyone in that game, which, even watching back, just in terms of the highlights, whilst researching this video, it is hard to believe that Liverpool actually won, and what on earth actually happened during those six extraordinary minutes. Oliver Bierhoff versus Czech Republic What do the last two inclusions have in common? They were both substitutions, which happened in major European finals, featuring Vladimir Schmitzer. Five points if you got that bad boy right. And in third place, we are transported to Wembley Stadium for the final of Euro 96. Germany and the Czech Republic had both won their respective semi-finals via penalty shootouts at the tournament in England, and the two teams had actually met in the group stage where Germany won 2-0. The Germans were the favourites once again at Wembley, but with an hour on the clock, the Czechs seemingly hadn't been sent the script. Patrick Berger, another former Liverpool man, put the central Europeans ahead by the penalty spot in the 59th minute. With Germany in trouble, manager Verti Votz decided to take evasive action, withdrawing Bayern Munich midfielder Mehmet Scholl and replacing him with a forward, in the form of Oliver Bierhoff. Bierhoff wasn't particularly well known in Germany at the time. He had left the country in his early 20s, having struggled to score goals for Hamburg and Borussia Mönchengladbach, but he had scored goals prolifically in Serie A during the intervening years. It took Bierhoff less than four minutes to find the back of the net following his introduction, and within half an hour, he had ensured that no one would ever forget his name. If there is one thing Oliver Bierhoff is known for, it is his remarkable aerial ability, and his first goal was a trademark header which flew past Petr Kuba. There was a touch of fortune about the Udinese frontman's second, which took a couple of deflections before finding the back of the net to automatically win Germany the game, since it was a golden goal, but his overall impact in the game, in terms of his size, presence, and goals, were absolutely enormous, and more than deserving of a bronze medal. Teddy Sheringham and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer versus Bayern Munich. Is it cheating to include two players as a single inclusion in this seven? I think the answer is probably yes, but I can't imagine anyone is going to stop me and I don't think it's actually illegal or anything, so hopefully I'll be all right. The truth is that it is impossible to split the introduction of Teddy Sheringham and Ole Gunnar Solskjaer in the 1999 Champions League final in terms of their importance, as Manchester United staged the greatest and most decisive injury time comeback victory in the entire history of the sport. Bayern Munich took the lead against Alex Ferguson's side just six minutes into the game, and they led for the next 85 minutes. In the 67th minute, Fergie switched to a three up front, introducing Teddy Sheringham in place of Jesper Blomqvist, and just nine minutes from time, Ole Gunnar Solskjaer came on in place of Andy Cole. Mehmet Scholl, the man who was replaced by Oliver Bierhoff in the Euro 96 final, saw his lob hit the crossbar when Bayern Munich led 1-0 with a chance that almost certainly would have put the game to bed. 
It's funny how players keep cropping up in multiple entries, isn't it? In the first minute of injury time, Manchester United won a corner. As David Beckham rushed over to take it, Peter Schmeichel came up for Manchester United from the back. Desperate times call for desperate measures, and this really was the last chance saloon for Manchester United. Schmeichel wouldn't score, but perhaps served as a useful decoy, as Teddy Sheringham latched onto a second ball, swivelled, and put the Red Devils back on level terms. Two minutes later, in the 93rd minute, his fellow substitute Ole Gunnar Solskjaer did the unthinkable, latching onto a Teddy Sheringham header this time, as the two substitutes combined to divert the ball into the roof of the net, and had Manchester United the most dramatic of last-minute Champions League victories. So, you see, how could I possibly pick between the two of them? Gunter Netzer vs Cologne I know what you're thinking. What could possibly beat Gareth Bale scoring an unforgettable brace in a Champions League final, Oliver Bierhoff turning a Euros final on its head, or two substitutes both scoring at injury time in a legendary Champions League final comeback win? I'll tell you what, it's Gunter Netzer in the final of the 1973 DFB Pokal. The greatest substitute of all time for more reasons than one. Gunter Netzer was never a man who seemed to have too many doubts about his own talents. A cult hero in Germany by 1973, due to his long flowing hair, rebellious personality, and playboy lifestyle, when Borussia Mönchengladbach reached the 1973 DFB Pokal final, their best player started the game on the bench. Netzer had already stated his intention to leave the club that summer, with his heart set on a move to Spain. He would eventually sign for Real Madrid as Los Blancos' response to Barcelona signing Johan Cruyff. But for one last game, he was still a Borussia Mönchengladbach man. At half-time in the final, the scores were all tied at one all, with Gladbach having conceded five minutes before the half drew to a close. When manager Hennis Weisweiler asked Netzer if he wanted to come on, the moody midfielder responded by saying, They don't need me. The game was still tied after 90 minutes, sending the match to extra time. As the full-time whistle blew, midfielder Christian Kulik went down with cramp, struggling to carry on. Unprompted, Netzer removed his tracksuit and told Wiesvila simply, Ich spiel dann jetzt, meaning, I'll go and play now. Netzer had effectively substituted himself on, and go and play he did. Less than two minutes later, after his self-appointed introduction, Netzer played a brilliant one-two, firing the ball with his left foot into the top corner. In his parting gift to the Gladbach fans, who had been chanting his name all game, Netzer scored the winner in the final of the DFB Pokal. It was beautiful, poetic, typically Netzerian, and, quite possibly, the greatest substitution of all time. So that is it for today's video, but thank you all very much as ever for watching. Hit the like button if you enjoyed it, let me know your thoughts down below in the comments, and make sure you're subscribed and have notifications turned on for the one and only HITC7s. You can also find me on Twitter or Instagram via the username at HITC7s on both, should that sound like something that you would like to do.